lots of things we use in our daily life. So I'd like to pay attention to that. Dr. Sheen, the yeah, Anthony USC, as long as I remember, probably at least 25 years ago, the teacher was born. And uh, <laughs> she, has, uh, she has received all kinds of support that the best teachers have so, so to so She has worked with us a number of similar camps in the past, and she's always the highest rated. So, very pleased to have you here during the summer break and uh, enjoy a presentation. Go ahead. Oh, it's great to be here. Uh, I, uh, can you see the screen? Is there something in your way? No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Yeah, okay. Um, in the past, you know, I had a PowerPoint uh, presentation for all of these things. And uh, uh, it so happened that last year I got lucky because the History Channel made a very nice 30-minute uh, um, you know, video, uh, which they showed on the History Channel. I don't know if you guys watched History Channel. Okay, oh, you okay. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and uh, it covers... Virtually most of the things I had on my PowerPoint, but they had more better graphics, obviously. They had production budget that I don't have. Okay. So, um, so I, I'm going to show a, a good, you know, the, the video as we go along. Uh, but you remember the video is for a more sort of a, um, average audience, but with some technical uh, background. You guys should be beyond that, okay? So occasionally I'm gonna stop and ask you some questions. Okay. Yay. Okay. Uh -huh. okay. Okay. <laughs> um, the first twofold reason why I do that is this right after lunch. Okay, if I, if I've been teaching for twenty some years. Classes after lunch always suffer from the blood goes to the stomach, and then I'm moving to the brain, and tend to those off. Occasionally, uh, I'll stop and ask you Okay. Anyway, we're going to go. I like that. It's nice. You don't want to I can't pay attention to you. Just we had ourselves. Yeah. 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 You know what? Did you choose Yeah. So, That's mad like. Modern box. Hello? So, yeah. I'm just sort of. A little bit into it, okay. Um, I think in your um, folder it says uh, the title of this is um, what? All Everywhere. Oh, yeah, hydrocarbon. Hydrocarbon. <laughs> okay. Uh, it might uh, uh, sort of uh, appear very interesting to you that, you know, oh. I know that. Right? Like hydrocarbon is yeah. everywhere, so tell me something I don't know, right? Okay. Now, um, the, the reason that the, the title is uh, the way it is, is to show that uh, most of people associate hydrocarbon uh, with, of course, petroleum, right? And, uh, and the number one uh, thing people associate with petroleum is its use as a fuel, right? Yeah. Okay, drive your car, whatever, thing, whatever, okay? Uh, and, but this is something that is, of course, uh, driven by um, Western industrialized society, particularly the U.S., which is very car-centric, right? And in fact, uh, if you look at petroleum uh, it, in a holistic way, it actually serves many, many purposes, okay? As an energy source, uh, fuel is only part of it, okay? And one of the at least to, to a chemical engineer, much more interesting 
uh, application is its role as raw material for other things. Yeah. Oh, so wait, is this an organic fuel? Hmm? Is this an organic fuel? Uh, oil? What do you mean? Uh, okay. Hydrocarbons? Because don't hydrocarbons make up like those organic molecules? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And from the shirts on our backs to the roof. Should have said that. Thank you. Okay. Very good. He, he's, he's trying to play. Uh, it's possible. Yes. No. So. It looks like some stress. <laughs> so if you think the lube is all about the pump, well, think again. Now, the secrets of oil on Modern Marvels. the warning. The world as we know it has come to an end. <laughs> Uncertain supplies and rising demand have made cheap oil a thing of the past. Sure, that means higher prices at the gas pump, but that's not the only impact. Not by a long shot. You may not realize it, but the first secret of oil is simple. It's everywhere. We can talk about asphalt, or aspirin, Cosmetics to computers, helmets to heart valves, safety glass to shower curtains, umbrellas to Ziploc bags, and everything in between. Oil lubricates our machines, our weapons, and even our skin. It binds the building materials in our roads and homes. And it provides the chemical building blocks for plastics, rubber, and synthetic fibers. Just look around. 30% of your television is made from petroleum-based materials. At least 50% of your sneakers. Your exercise attire, nearly 100% oil-derived. And also the laundry detergent used to clean it. Contact lenses, check. Your toothbrush, ditto. But wait, did he really say aspirin is made from oil? Aspirin and, and many other pharmaceuticals are petroleum-based products. Cancer-fighting drugs. I think it's an unknown fact that the petrochemical industry provides the basic building blocks. A little more than a century ago, none of this was true. Back then, rubber came from trees. Plastics were all but unknown. And our biggest mode of transportation required moving tons of coal. But then rose the combustion engine. Our mobility soared, and oil has been king ever since. Our whole society has really matured around the concept of this fantastic material available at a very low cost that could be delivered to our doors. And the last 100 years, 50 years, has been just figuring out new ways to take advantage of that great raw material, natural gas, crude oil, just making so many magical things uh, happen. A single barrel of crude equals 42 gallons. And Americans consume about 20 million of them every day. Roughly 50% of every barrel goes to finished gasoline, while another 15% to diesel. Remarkably, it's that remaining 35% that's become the backbone of our world. So what is it about petroleum that makes it so versatile, and for now, so vital? Inside each barrel is a rich mix of hydrogen and carbon molecules, formed in all sorts of combinations known as hydrocarbons. Some, like C1, better known as methane, are relatively simple hydrocarbons and are considered light. Automotive fuels contain slightly longer chains, while others, such as the chemical structure of motor oil, contain heavy, complex chains of 50 or more carbon atoms. Separate these different molecules within the crude, and you generate potent energy sources like gasoline and diesel. Yet within what remains is a rich assortment of chemical building blocks known as feedstocks. It all depends on refining. What a refinery basically does is take the crude oil, rearrange molecules through various processes, some to make gasoline, some to make diesel, some to make jet fuel, but a lot to, to make the basic building blocks for many industries worldwide to use as finished products. Valero Oil is the largest oil refiner in North America. Here at their Wilmington, California refinery, 
They process more than 135,000 barrels daily, which arrive via tanker ship and are pumped ashore. This is a line that we receive crude off of the crude ships. The crude is brought in through this line. It's a 30 inch line. It goes into the tanks that you see behind us. Uh, we have four crude tanks, approximately 300,000 barrels each. Think of any refinery as a giant chemistry set performing four basic tasks, distillation, hydrocleaning, cracking, and blending. Each stage is designed to create more exact and more pure feedstocks. Stage one is distillation, which separates the primary hydrocarbons from one another. Crude distillation is the first step in the refining process. This is where we take the raw crude oil that comes in from the crude tanks and we begin our initial separation. A furnace connected to this tower begins to boil the oil to upwards of 700 degrees Fahrenheit. As the heat intensifies, different hydrocarbon molecules within the crude begin to vaporize at different temperatures. Now separated, these vapors rise within the tower, cool, condense, and are then drawn off at specific levels. The lightest hydrocarbons, like the liquid gases used to make aspirin, rise to the top, while the heavier ones used in motor oils and road materials remain toward the bottom. The result? The once singular crude has been separated into a variety of fractions. What we get in crude fractionation is these products that you see here. So starting with the lightest product, we have natural gas, which has to be stored under pressure stored in this container. We have a light gasoline product, uh, a heavier gasoline product called naphtha. We have jet fuel range and diesel range products. We have gas oil range products. And we have uh, residuals like asphalt, or in this case, this is a sample of coke. None of the fractions that come off the distillation tower are finished products, and all will require further processing. After more than a million years underground, most need a good cleaning to rid them of contaminants, especially sulfur. In this process, we bring the oil in and mix it with hydrogen. We pass it through the heat exchangers behind me and the heater to my left, and we heat the oil up to about 700 degrees. At that point, we pass it over a catalyst, and that catalyst, along with the hydrogen, removes contaminants in the oil before we send it on for further processing. The result? a clean, contaminant-free product, like this jet fuel. In fact, most airports maintain direct pipelines to local refineries. And as for all that removed sulfur, it's collected and sold as a key ingredient in agricultural fertilizers, in rubber tire manufacture, in fire extinguishers, and even in explosives. But not every fraction is ready yet. And some even need an atomic makeover. Cracking shatters larger complex hydrocarbon molecules into simpler, more useful ones, which are then made into finished products. This can be done either directly with intense heat or in combination with chemical catalysts see this is the sort of catalyst we use it uh, almost moves like a liquid uh, what we do is we mix this catalyst at very high temperature with the gas oil uh, over 1300 degrees and it, it reacts to form these lighter products that you see here cracking heavy gas oils into smaller hydrocarbon molecules creates this base oil used to power ships in addition the cracking makes propylene captured in this canister Propylene is a feedstock used in makeup, toothpaste, antifreeze, paints, and polyurethane products, including football helmets. No new oil refinery has been built in the United States since 1974. Only through new efficiencies have refiners been able to keep up with ever-rising demand. We don't throw anything away. The barrel of crude is much too valuable a resource not to try to use everything we can out of it. We try to use 100% of that barrel. Throughout its history, 
the industry has used chance discoveries to turn what seemed like waste into useful products. Rod wax was a whitish goo that came out of the ground on drill bits and often clogged the mechanisms. Only after learning that oil workers used the rod wax as a bomb for cuts did chemist Robert Chesborough begin to toy with it. Later naming his new product, Vaseline. Although no longer scraped from rigs, today a jar of Vaseline is sold every 39 seconds as a byproduct of refined lubricant oils. Petroleum coke, the nasty black residue left after all the other fractions are removed, was deemed the bottom of the barrel until used in ironworks to help fuel their furnaces. Waste is a resource, so they started looking for and finding uses for these various byproducts that were created in the, the refining process. And in 1910, a Ford Model T owner urged a scientist named Walter Snelling to examine vapors rising from his gas tank vents. Two years later, Snelling filed a patent for the oil-borne gas, propane. Propane is one of those fuels that nobody makes on purpose. It is a byproduct, and we've been able to uh, uh, basically, as an industry, uh, build a business uh, on a product that in the early years of, of the industry was literally flared off as a waste product. Propane arises at multiple stages during refining. Think of it as pure bonus. It's an energy-rich hydrocarbon. It has about two and three-quarter times as much hydrogen per molecule as, say, a natural gas molecule. It's also a very, very clean burning fuel, and it's cost-effective. Propane produces 18 to 24 percent less CO2 than gasoline. Today, 17 million homes rely on propane for home heating, cooking, and power. Organic farmers use its heat to wither weeds in their fields and to sanitize livestock houses without chemicals. <laughs> and of course, more than oh. 50 million homes use it to fire up the family barbecue. <laughs> Imagine 2% of the energy market being tapped in by 50 million plus uh, uh, folks just for barbecuing. Portability has always been a prime advantage of all oil and its derivatives. Okay. Uh, you know, you heard uh, a couple of terms. Uh, okay. Uh, what's a catalyst? A catalyst is something that is used Speeds up the reaction. And uh, what forms do they, does it come in? Uh, it could come like liquid in different, many different forms, right? But the one they shared right there was liquid. Catalyst is basically like the very fundamental level. Uh, if you have studied chemistry, the lowest the activation energy or reaction, right? So therefore, it doesn't change the end result, but just get that. Right? Okay. Now it can come in any number of uh, forms. Basically, it, it catalyzes by forming some intermediate. Uh, uh, complex or whatever, okay, then leads to the final product. Okay. So it, this catalyst could be a gas, could be a liquid, could be a solid. Alright? And in the all the uh, business, the okay, catalysts are, are mostly metal. <coughs> Platinum, molybdenum, uh, quite expensive, of course. Anybody know how expensive is platinum? Platinum. <laughs> how many dollars an ounce? Give me ball ballpark. Two thousand. Two thousand. Twenty. Who says twenty? You said twenty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm buying a whole bunch from you. Okay. One hundred thousand. Yeah. Thousands. So it's for me. Per ounce. Gold is nine hundred per ounce. Okay. Oh, that's number is three hundred thousand. Okay. 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 Okay.
the gasoline, because gasoline usually in the, in the, uh, uh, when it's formed originally from organic material, it's sulfur. Okay. Mm. So, but then if you just don't remove the sulfur, then it produces the carbon dioxide and cause it has the rain. Because right there, like, there's like a big old mountain, and like, it stinks. Like, if you pass yes, by there, it stinks. stinks. It's like, oh, oh it's you know, nasty. Okay. <laughs> you know what most avian gas comes from? Sulfur? Hydrogen sulfur. Oh, stinks. <laughs> okay, alright. So, so they have to remove the sulfur because they don't want to cause uh, air pollution and all that. Okay, so that has to be removed. Um, actually, you know, there is not enough market for uh, sulfur, okay, because you produce so much, you know, sulfur that, uh, you know, part of it is used to make fertilizer or whatever, you know, the fertilizer is true. So, so, you know, they're just recovering as much as they can from a, a kind of a waste product, okay, but they're not getting a lot of money back. They are required to remove it. Okay? Yeah, they should remove it. <laughs> of course. <laughs> not good for your lungs, not good for <laughs> no. Anyway, uh, so that's the yellow stuff. Okay? Yeah. Now, um, the other stuff, uh, they talk about poly, uh, uh, they talk about a gas called propylene, which is like the stuff to make, uh, 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 uh mm -hmm. okay. and then propane to, for the body, barbecue, okay. <laughs> What's the difference between propylene and, uh, propane? Structure is yeah. Okay, so tell me more. Like How many carbons do they have? Um, four. One is a double bond. Three. Uh, oh, yeah. double bond. Okay. Okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Okay. So <laughs> the double bond is the propylene. Okay. The, the one that doesn't have the double bond is propane. Okay. Which you're using in your uh, so the one that's so called saturated, no double bond, is used as a fuel. Okay. The one that has a double bond is used as a feedstock to make something else. Why? Why? Why do you need a double bond? Because it stays together. So you can break something down? It's more stable. So, it, huh? So, who said that? Because it makes it more stable. Double bond makes it more stable? Or stronger. Or more. It's true. Maybe a year. Compared to the stability of propylene and propane, which is more stable? It's propylene. Propane. Or propane, sorry. Yes. Propane. Okay. A saturated is always more stable because it's you're saturated, you're satisfied, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> the unsaturated are something missing, okay? So if it's something missing, you go and grab whatever, okay? Because so when you open up the double bond, you can add stuff, okay? You can make other compounds. So to, for, for it to be a feedstock to something else, it needs to have a reactive part, okay? So propane will be useless, or pretty much useless, as a feedstock for other synthesis, okay? Because it's already done. Okay? Uh, happy. Okay? Uh, Hopefully, uh, it's another the story. It's unhappy. So you can give stuff to it and then it will, you know, it's like two, you know, hands that's holding each, each other, you know. And uh, if somebody else can come and grab your hand, you know, you can open up your hands and whatever, you know. Anybody can hold my hand. <laughs> so. <laughs> So the, the idea of feedstock is that it must have reactive parts, okay, which is typically double or even triple bond, which is unsaturated. Okay? So that's the idea. <coughs> now, uh, we use uh, propane in, in, the, in the cylinder, right? You know, uh, I think in fact, if I come to this, I don't want to pause it. Uh, now, uh, so uh, we also use uh, it as, uh, a, as a transportation fuel, right? Some buses and uh, uh, cars are run on propane, right? Because it's cleaner. Okay. Uh, so propane is cleaner than gas. Than gasoline. Okay, because it's use less CO2. Okay, I'm kidding. Right. Um, that um, for the same energy output. Um, so uh, you heard about, you know, let's say replacing uh, uh, gasoline to run your car, right? One of the things that you can do is uh, hydrogen, right? Hydrogen. So what's the difference between running a car with hydrogen and running a car with propane? Hydrogen is a byproduct of water. Okay. And? And it's more expensive. 
Harder to make. She said harder to make. Out of, okay, yeah. No CO2 emission. Yeah, okay. We will, is the, nice the cost the same? No, the cost isn't right, the same. Right. If you, no, the car, the, the car itself, is the same car? No. So you, what's the the, oh, the energy it. source? The energy source. Is you know, so the the, the 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 key part of the car that delivers the energy to run to turn the wheels. Okay. In the case of uh, propane, what does it do? Plastic it combustion. Right. Yeah. And just just like you burn gasoline, right? Yes. So the the. The, the uh, engine is the internal combustion engine, right? Mm -hmm. Just like gasoline, uh, with mo modification. Okay, the principle is the same. So would the hydrogen want to be an external combustion? Uh, <laughs> 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 Not good gas, but... Boiling? 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 Okay, so how do you, you burn all hydrogen? No, you can't burn it, don't you? You can, of course you can burn hydrogen. But do you do that in the car, in your hydrogen car, you're going to burn? No, electricity. it'll blow up, right? Yeah, that too. Right. <laughs> that, there's another reason why. Okay, the, the engine in a hydrogen car is not an internal combustion engine. Okay? You're guessing external because I said internal. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, good guess, but... <laughs> what kind of device? is used to, to, to extract the energy contained in hydrogen. Two words, F and C. Fuel cells. Okay. <laughs> All right. We know it. <laughs> see, see, a lot of you, you guys know things. When, when, when I ask the direct question, right? But you no. don't see, it means that you know it, but you don't know it. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know the facts, but you don't... Uh, Internalize it. You know yes. the implication of it. Okay. So by the time you get to college, you're gonna learn that. Okay. Right. All right. It, 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 the, the question is not gonna come to you that you know, uh, you know, whatever fuel cell. Whatever. You know, the answer is not that right. You need to think. Okay. All right. So what's the difference between a fuel cell and an internal combustion uh, engine? So I don't want the, the detailed uh, mechanical design. Okay. Hmm. What's the advantage and disadvantage? The advantage. Oh no, no, I was. Just, uh, the, isn't the advantage to fuel cells, the fuel cells that you can combine that with like something else? I'm sorry, I'm talking about right now. Okay. And then, it's a huge they, advantage. But aren't it's they harder to hold? Huge hard advantage, which is very, very fundamental. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fusion reactions. Yeah. 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 Okay, <laughs> right? Ever heard? You, you guys know the answer, okay? That's why I say you know it, but you don't know it. Okay? I give you a hint. Ever heard thermodynamics? Oh, no. Ah! <laughs> ah! Okay, tell me the answer now. So what's the answer? Hey! Tell me the answer. Give you so many hints. Like, what does it right. start with? <laughs> Sorry, give me the letter. <laughs> okay. So. Oh, because it feels how smaller. Uh, what? It's <laughs> thermodynamics. So what's thermodynamics? Oh, thermal. I think it's thermal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thermal. Yeah, it's not. First thing. No. I've never had. It's first thing. But that's the chemistry. You also had some. It's spontaneous. Okay. Let, give me an answer and you tell me. Oh, I actually know it. Okay. Now, in the internal combustion machine, you burn it. Right? So the fuel uh, that gives up heat. Oh, so it's ex exothermic, right. and so in a hydrogen machine, would we endothermic? Uh, another good guess, but not that. <laughs> okay. In a in a combustion, you convert the chemical energy in the bonds into thermal energy, heat. Then the heat is used to run the, the, a internal combustion machine to, to to turn that into mechanical energy, which is turning the, the wheels. Okay. So it goes through a thermal cycle. It has to go to the heat state and then go to the mechanical state. Anybody who had physics would remember this, right? Yeah. Okay, now. See, she, you know it, but you don't know it. Okay. Now, uh, now you should be able to answer the question. In the fuel cell, what happens? Is it just used right away? Ah, good guess. Oh, yeah, you know it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it skips the thermal step. Alright? It's more efficient. Absolutely. Okay? 
the energy contained in the hydrogen, the chemical energy in the bond, is directly converted to electricity. Now, that runs the you know, electrical motor that runs your car. Right? So there are no sort of pistons in your in your hydrogen that is it's a electrical motor. Yes. Is there another name for fuel cell? Not really. Okay. But, okay, well, okay. Uh, well, fuel cells now has, has become a generic name uh, for devices which uh, uses uh, the energy in the fuel without going through a uh, thermal step. All right? Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, what's the, so you say, well, okay, so what's the downside of being a thermostat? Okay, the downside of a thermostat is that when you take the chemical energy and make it the thermal energy and back to a mechanical energy, the loss of thermodynamics says that you lose a good part of it. Okay, and, and, and you can never, you know, there, there's a natural limit. Okay, it doesn't matter how good the technology is, you are going to lose. 70% of it, okay, at the beginning, okay, and then you have to add in friction and all that sort of thing, okay, so that 70% lost, you do not incur in the fuel cell, okay, so there's a huge advantage to fuel cell, of course, then, then you say, well, why aren't we using fuel cells uh, in everything, because, of course, there are downsides, fuel cell runs on the basis of a, essentially an electrochemical reaction, Okay. Electric chemical reaction in general are slow, except combustion. Right? Combustion is a mild explosion. Okay? Right? Okay. The only fast reaction are explosions and combustion. The rest is slow. Okay? You can generally not speed it up that much unless you go to very high temperature and of course you don't want. So the problem is fuel cell is to make it much faster. Okay? And also, fuel um, cell has other uh, uh, sort of uh, limitations. But anyway, okay. So now, uh, so there are a lot of uh, problems you have to solve uh, when you, uh, let's say, uh, you want to use hydrogen as a fuel uh, for, uh, for a car. Okay? You have to perfect the fuel cell technology. And then you have to, uh, to produce the hydrogen in the first place. So it has, if it is convenient, it has to be uh, in a form that you can readily transport. Okay. You ever transported hydrogen? Compared to propane, propane is a gas, right? Okay, your barbecue. It's a gas. Hydrogen is also a gas. But people transport propane all the time in cylinders. Okay? And do the same thing with hydrogen. <laughs> Except. Right. You have to freeze it, right? Or something? Huh? You have to freeze it? Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Okay. Now, you can store a lot of propane in the cylinder because you can liquefy it. Okay? In the cylinder, the propane is a liquid. Okay? So, but when you tap it, it then vaporizes and you burn it. Okay? So, in terms of mass, you can store a lot of propane in the cylinder. But you say, well, what if I do the same with hydrogen? I just liquefy hydrogen. You can. You can. You can. You can. But you have to go to very low temperature. Okay. Hydrogen is very light gas. You know, you want to liquefy, you go to minus whatever. Okay, and it's not going to happen. Okay. The storage at a, a large amount of hydrogen in a car because you have to carry the hydrogen with you, right? You can't like drawing, you know, pipeline behind the car, right? It has to be, you know, stored in a tank somewhere, right? So either it's stored under extremely high pressure, which is so good, something hit your car, you know, if the tank has to be robust enough to uh, okay. or they, they, uh, do something else. Maybe there are technologies developed to uh, absorb the hydrogen in a metal matrix. So it actually liquefies it without being cold. Right? But hey, it takes time to get you know, you have a matrix that can so so there are a lot of problems with hydrogen uh, as a fuel cell. Uh, it's a very good long-term thing, but it's a long 
away from being truly viable as a replacement for uh, you know, gasoline or natural gas. Based on cost, right? Yeah. But, you know, uh, there, there might be some breakthrough in technology which then make it all. Uh, how do I get? Oh, this guy. Okay. Compared to coal, for example, it's an easy resource to move. Oil is very versatile. And one of the key things about it is that it's a liquid, which makes it easily transportable. Propane is no exception. Manufacturers put the gas under pressure, which causes it to reform as a liquid, making it 270 times more compact. Because it can be stored as a liquid and consumed as a gas, you have a great deal of options in terms of the type of applications that it can be put to, and that seems sort of counterintuitive in many respects, but that's one of the unique properties of propane is that it can be a liquid and it can be used as a gas as well. Only when the tank valve is opened and the pressure inside normalized does the liquid propane return to its original gas form. And at that point, it's ready to roll. Propane is the most widely used alternative motor fuel in the world. There are about 11 million vehicles that, that operate on propane every day. Uh, here in the United States, anyone that's been to Las Vegas and taken a taxi cab from the airport to a hotel is ridden in a propane-powered taxi cab. But if you think that's all there is to oil, answer this. What do hot tubs, packing peanuts, and top-secret weapons depots have in common? One word, plastics, petroleum's most prolific byproduct. In the early 1900s, a young entrepreneur observed his sister, Mabel, mix coal dust with oil-based Vaseline and apply it to her eyelashes. Soon after, he created Maybelline, one of America's leading cosmetics brands. Each year, American refineries process more than six billion barrels of oil. But here's a stunning fact. From less than 5% of that, comes more than a hundred billion pounds of plastic. That's more plastic than the combined weight of every man, woman, and child in the United States. Plastic is oil's most abundant finished product. We can't live without it, and it's getting expensive. Even something as simple as a paper cup, its functionality is based on having plastic on the inside here, because if you didn't have that plastic, your latte would be all over your lap, because it's the plastic that seals the liquids inside and allows this cup to do its job. Monomers, the chemicals from which plastics are made, come from the gases collected during refining of oil and natural gas. Like other fractions, these gases are cracked into smaller hydrocarbon elements known as chemical feedstocks. From seven basic feedstocks, including ethylene, propylene, and benzene, nearly all the plastic in the world is manufactured. Nylon is an example where we can actually show you how it's made. So we add in here a diacid, and then we're going to add a diamine. And at the interface of these two chemicals, both are derived from oil, you end up with nylon. Each year, more than 8 billion pounds of nylon make everything from stockings to parachutes. But nylon's not alone when it comes to many uses. Nearly every plastic can be formed and shaped in infinite ways. That's what makes it so valuable. A lot of folks think that plastics have always been cheap, you know, but that isn't true. Actually, for a long time, plastics have been more expensive than metals. The part of it that's cheap is manufacturing all of those different types of things. Spartec Plastics is an international manufacturer of plastic materials. With an annual production of more... you understand what he said? It's, it's, you know, plastic was more expensive than metal. A plastic product is cheap because of manufacturing. you understand what he means? So it's expensive to make? 
the, the raw material may be more expensive than, you know, if you compare metals and yeah. metal products, plastic and product, plastic products. The raw material, okay, for a long time, uh, the plastic raw material is actually more expensive than some metals. Okay. The finished product, plastic finished product is much cheaper than metal finished product. The reason is it's much more expensive to fashion objects from things like metals than plastic. Plastic can, it's so moldable. You know, you can you can join pieces together in even the different ways. So you can heat it and then you'll fix it. Okay? And then you can, you know, do all sorts of things. You can glue it, whatever. Because with a metal, good luck, you have to machine it. You have to rivet. You have to screw. Labor intensive. Right? So if you, if you have to rivet, you know, every rivet is a single step. Right? But if you if you join uh, uh, two pieces of plastic uh, by a, you know, heat gun, you know, you just, you know, it's done. Okay? So it's very, very easy and flexible to manufacture to make it into any shape and put components together. Right? So that's why it's so flexible and so versatile. 1.7 billion pounds. Their materials can be found in everything from food packaging to tanning beds to bullet resistant windows. Here at their La Mirada, California facility, the focus is on plastic sheeting and rolls, made from two of the more prominent plastics. This plant primarily runs ABS or polystyrene. They're both a, uh, a styrenic based material. Every time you open your refrigerator door, the shelf, the food liner, and certainly the door, that's polystyrene as well. ABS and polystyrene arrive at the Spartec facility in the form of plastic pellets. Some are virgin stock, others recycled. Air hoses move them throughout the facility until they reach the extruder, the heart of the operation. Inside this heat extruder is a long auger screw. It steadily rotates, pulling the plastic pellets toward its opposite end. As the pellets compress and rub against one another, friction and heat are created, causing the plastic to melt. The taffy-like mix is then pushed through a thin die, forming a plastic sheet that threads across a series of rollers. It may look fairly simple, uh, but there's a lot of geometry and a lot of calculations that go into the design of a screw, and a lot of that has just been derived by trial and error over time. This roll stock will be used in various packaging, while a quick change to a larger die results in plastic sheets. They can be shaped into single plastic pieces for spas, boats, even kayaks. You put this sheet in a couple of ovens and you just gently heat it on there as opposed to the really vigorous heating they went through to melt it. It will begin to soften until it begins to just sag and that's what they'll refer to it as the sag that it's got. That's moved around then and put over a mold and the old vacuum forming technique just pulls it down and sucks it down to make the form of whatever part it is that you want. Thermoforming is a key method for custom plastic manufacturing. But there are others, including welding. Vinyl, also known as PVC, is a petro-based plastic known for its durability and flexibility. Its practicalities were first teed up in the 1920s by a chemical engineer in search of, legend holds, a better golf ball. Today, oil-based plastics still play a role in golf ball manufacture. And PVC's advantages have spread across industry, healthcare, and the military. Since 1997, the U.S. military has destroyed nearly 55% of its Cold War arsenal of chemical weapons. But it's still got nearly 14,000 tons to go, and surrounded by an environment filled with deadly agents like sarin, 
A worker's protective suit means the difference between life and death. Here at Vinyl Technology, they've manufactured more than 130,000 of these life-saving vinyl suits. The suit is basically 99% plastic material. The visor is basically convertible window material, which you'll find in convertible cars. Everything else is a special alloy of plastic films that's been specially developed for the chemical agent protection. It's made to slow down the permeation of that agent through the material to provide the worker with as long a working time as possible. There are no sewn parts or stitching on the suits. Instead, all the seams are welded using ultra-high radio frequencies to fuse the materials together. If you take a look, you'll see some of the intricate welds that, that go around the perimeter of the visor, welding the vinyl to the alloy, which is the white material. All the seams are extremely clean, and the seams are on the outside and provide the maximum comfort for the wearer. The suits aren't completed until they meet the workers who wear them. When the workers are preparing for an entry, they will don the suit, and then they will physically get heat sealed into the suit using a similar type of machine that we've used to manufacture the suits. So once they're in, they're in for good. They do their work, and they physically get cut out of the suit, and the suit is disposed of at that point. So oil is effective at keeping deadly chemicals out. But what happens if you swallow it by mistake? Odds are, you already have. Roughly 9% of every oil barrel's output is jet fuel. I don't know if you guys got the joke. I think most people wouldn't get the joke. You'd probably swallow it. What was it showing that? Mineral oil. Okay. You take mineral oil for what? Anybody know? Mineral oil is a Huh? No clue. If you fail to go to the bathroom for three days. Oh, um Okay? Oh it's good for it's a laxative. Oh. So that's the joke. Okay? You probably oh. have swallowed it. And the airline industry burns through 19 billion gallons of it annually. Add just one penny to its cost per gallon, and airline expenses soar more than $180 million. When it comes to big, there isn't much that's larger than the crawler transporter, the vehicle that moves the space shuttle from point A to point B. <laughs> So it's hard to imagine that this six million pound behemoth has much in common with an ordinary watch. Despite their size difference, beneath their exteriors, both mechanisms have lots of moving parts. And whether they weigh a few tons or a few microns, moving parts almost always need oil-based lubricants. A lubricant is designed to really do two different things. One is to prevent wear, and the other is, whenever you have moving parts, there's heat generated. So it really lubricates by taking the heat away that's formed, and also to keep the surfaces from rubbing together. Lubricants are made from base oils, fractioned from the heavier elements off the distillation tower. They're considered among the most valuable fractions, even as they represent less than 8% of a barrel's output. That's because they do so many things, from helping to move the shuttle to steering a missile, to ensuring the chain on the chainsaw saws. Manufacturer Lubricating Specialties receives base oils from refineries all over the country and blends them into more than a thousand different lubes every month. Of course, we make motor oils. That's our probably our number one product that, that we make. We do specialty things with fire-resistant hydraulic fluids, which are very important in foundries, so if you get a leak, it doesn't catch fire. We also manufacture 
uh, Navy oils that are used in the hydraulics on ships to move the rudders, uh, missile batteries or guns, and also the catapult oil to you know, launch the airplanes. Any lubricant's job is to form a thin film between two moving parts. It must be thick enough to withstand the friction generated as the parts work yet not so thick is to inhibit or degrade the part's performance. Viscosity is the term used to describe that thickness, and it's determined by the blend of base oils from the refinery with additional chemical additives. This is what we call the blending area, or fondly known as the snake pit. This is where we take and blend all the raw materials. Some are easy, one or two ingredients. Some are complicated and have up to 20 ingredients. Some are liquid, some are solids. So this is where you make your money or you lose your money. Because if it goes wrong here, it's expensive. One of those additives is itself made from oil. And it puts the W, or winter, into 5W30. It's called a viscosity index improver and comes in 50-pound blocks. But check this out. It's not a solid at all. It's something that's cold flow. So as we sit here, we open the side here. If we came back tomorrow morning, it would all be on the ground. Even though it appears as a solid, it's really still a liquid, a very viscous, thick liquid. The improver is chopped, heated, and then blended into the motor oil to ensure that the oil itself continues to flow in all seasons. Because this is the substance that allows us to use the same motor oil in the winter as the summer. This expands very, very rapidly. In the cold state, it's more like a watch spring, very tightly wound together. But when it gets hot at 200 degrees, it really expands almost like a corkscrew. It gets very, very long and acts like a bunch of fibers to keep the thin motor oil from flowing very quickly and makes it seem thicker. So we can get a good cold temperature and a good high temperature. Today, few processes are as automated as food production and packaging. And here, too, the machines need a specialized lube called food-grade oil. It's even okay to swallow. These are required by the FDA to be used so that if accidentally the oil would get into some of the foods, it's no harm to you. This is hydrocarbon that's been extra processed, extra clean, it's handled food-grade all the way, special packaging, special drums, so it never comes in contact with any metal. But if the prospect that you might be eating oil surprises you, don't forget, you're also rubbing it all over. The baby oil that you buy is 100% this, with a little fragrance. Suntan lotion is probably 80% this, with a little bit of emulsifier. Lipstick is about 70% this, with a lot of dyes, and also some wax products to give it some consistency. It's used in just about everything that we put on ourselves. For most lubricants, it's one and done. Use it, replace it, and move on. But with oil prices on the rise, the world's most common lube, motor oil, can have a second life. There's 1.4 billion gallons of used oil generated in the United States every year. Here at Evergreen Oil, we take that used oil and we re-refine it, meaning we take the used oil and take it back to a near virgin state. We calculate we can use that same gallon over 20 times. <laughs> is different from reconditioned motor oil, which is often labeled second use and is simply filtered, but sometimes inconsistent results. Evergreen Oil estimates that full-scale re-refining could save upwards of 90,000 barrels of oil a day. So here's the used oil we just collected and brought here to Evergreen Oil. It's full of contaminants such as heavy metals, sulfur, might have some concentrations of halogens, it's dirty. We're going to take that, put it through our re-refinery, and process it into a reusable base loop. Re-refining works nearly backwards from the original refining process. First, the used oil is hydro-treated to remove not just the pollutants, but the additives as well. Remember that viscosity index improver? Well, in re-refining, it's got to go. What's left is then redistilled, creating a near pure fraction. This is our re-refined base lube into the process. All of the metals 
All of the contaminants, the additive package has been removed, all the water, all the light ends, and we've taken it to a near virgin state, and this is as uh, good as gold right here. Today, Evergreen re-refines more than 14 million gallons of used motor oil a year. The energy required to re-refine motor oil is close to 50% less than it takes to refine fresh crude. No doubt that's not just good business, but good for the environment as well. But motor oil is not the only recycled product when the time comes for the rubber to meet the road. And this one really rocks. Paraffin wax is a byproduct of lubricant oil refining. Not only is it non-toxic, each year it's shaped into more than 3 billion Crayola crayons, 1.5 billion paint balls, and 1 billion pounds of candle wax. Scorching sun, raging storms, vicious winds. No matter the conditions, we depend on our homes to withstand Mother Nature's fury. And nowhere does that protection matter more than on the roof. Enter oil. Today, four out of five U.S. homes are topped with asphalt shingles, the most common roofing material in the country. The asphalt industry manufactures 12.5 billion square feet of roofing shingle product on an annual basis. That's enough material to cover five million homes per year. Natural deposits of asphalt have existed for millions of years. And the ancients relied upon its sticky properties to build cities, waterproof boats, and even embalm mummies. Today, nearly all asphalt is derived from oil refining and makes up 3% of each barrel of crude. It's the dense, dark liquid that remains after the other lighter hydrocarbons are removed. Here at the Owens Corning Asphalt Shingle Manufacturing Center in Compton, California, they convert more than 110 tons of liquid asphalt every day. This is where the asphalt comes into our facility. It arrives in truck and then is transferred into the converter, which is the tower that's standing directly behind me. This is where we actually convert the asphalt into a roofing grade material. Hot air is blown into the asphalt to make it both soft and durable. Asphalt shingles are made from three primary elements. A synthetic mat made from paper or fiberglass, mineral granules, and finally the newly blown asphalt. Granules on the top of the shingle are coarse and coated with different colors. This offers buyers aesthetic choices, but also has the practical impact of deflecting the sun's UV rays, reducing heat. Once the materials are fused, the shingles are cooled. Then cut and finished in many ways to meet different markets. accounts for less than 15% of all asphalt that leaves the refinery. A still smaller amount goes into building water-resistant structures like seawalls, piers, and dikes. Where did the rest of it go? Yes. Asphalt? On the street. On the street. <laughs> so, we 
States, 94% of which are covered in asphalt. Vulcan asphalt produces upwards of 500 tons of paving asphalt an hour. And none of it would hold together without oil. We have to have that oil uh, to use as a binder, which binds it and holds it together. That gives us our compaction and helps make everything solid that we can drive on. So it's a very, very important ingredient. Paving asphalt is made from sand and various sized crushed rock, known as aggregate, which are mixed together into a blend. As you can see, I have various different sizes, some three quarters, some half inch, three eighths, sand. Uh, these are the various sizes that we use in the mixture. <laughs> square miles of asphalt, enough to pave over all of New Jersey, Connecticut, 
Delaware and Rhode Island. So what happens when it all runs out? No one knows the time or date, but there is an emerging consensus. As demand grows, supply will dwindle until one day crude oil will disappear as a primary natural resource. And we'd better start to prepare. If you look at this objectively, you realize that oh. this is oh. <laughs> <laughs> that perhaps it's not a use forever. Our finite resources, they never last forever. Uh, uh, so we're developing alternatives for almost so a million of oil's fractions. <laughs> and renewable energy supplies are on the move. <laughs> Wind power, for example, now supplies 1% of America's energy needs, echoing oil's own early history. And it doesn't stop there. This driveway is paved not with traditional asphalt, but a bio-asphalt garnered from sugarcane. And while most synthetic motor oil still contains petroleum, the cost of fully synthesizing lubricants continues to drop. Virgin Atlantic Airlines recently flew the first jetliner powered, in part, by a jet fuel created from algae. Photovoltaic solar cells like those atop this FedEx hub not only offer power today, but may well fuel the cars of tomorrow. Oh. And plastics that were once made from crude are now predominantly made from oil-based yet cleaner burning natural gas. Plastics can also be made from corn and other crops. But new supplies of energy and feedstocks aren't the only area of research and invention. Now, can these alternative energy sources make up for, you know, the decline in use of uh, oil and gas or coal? That's a question that depends on how much technology we can develop on the side of demand, on the other hand, you can make things a lot more efficient so that you can decrease the demand, and that's where recycling becomes an issue. Attacking demand by recycling what already exists is a familiar strategy in thousands of communities across the country. Look no further than plastic bottles, which regenerate into more than 20 million pounds of plastic every year. The challenge, however, is not in simple plastics like bottles, but more complicated products like TVs or computers, which contain many different kinds of plastics, all fused together. Until recently, the only answer was landfill. Enter the new science of recovery. A huge market is developing around recovering, and there are lots of folks out there hungry for plastics that can be recycled, but we've got to get them out of our trash. That's what we have to figure out ways to do. Not just because we're more environmentally conscious, but because plastic itself oh, has come up in <laughs> literally two or three or four times. In 1994, Trip Allen founded MBA Polymers to recover the plastics bonded together in high-tech equipment. You take advantage of the properties that the plastics have. For example, density. Plastics have a variety of density. Polyethylene, coming from like a detergent bottle or a milk jug, is lighter than water. Polyester, PET, which is used in your soda bottle, is heavier than water. So you take those two, grind them up, shake them up, so you have, just in a simple water solution, you see the separation. The polyethylene floats and the polyester, or PET, sinks. Now, it's not always that simple, and so you have other operations that you can use that, that will give you finer cuts. Today, computers contain 12 different types of plastic, all of which are recoverable. But what about a product that has 39 different plastics? You guessed it, the family car. This is what's left of the family car <laughs> when it gets shredded, they pull out the steel and a lot of the non-ferrous metals, and they leave behind a material that's called fluff, automotive fluff. This has got everything from taillight housings to rocks to carpeting. It's a real mix of materials. These leftovers are soon sent to landfills, 
it doesn't stink as much as regular garbage, so they use it to cover regular garbage. <laughs> <laughs> but like a prospector of old, Alan sees gold in those garbage hills. This truck uses a number of different technologies that are synthesized mostly from old mining industry ideas. California was founded around the gold rush, and what is gold mining other than sorting one type of shiny yellow rock from a lot of other dingy brown ones? The process begins with the automotive fluff passing through a series of magnets to remove any small metal bits. The fluff then enters a series of water cyclones, swirling tornadoes of H2O that intensify the sinking or floating of the different plastics and other elements within the fluff. By sorting everything by how rapidly it sinks or how rapidly it floats. So you know what the cyclone does? Mm -hmm. It separates the heavier objects from the lighter objects or the materials. So why do they have to use a cyclone? So it takes too long. It's a catalyst. using just water. There's a lot of steel and non-ferrous metals, but there's also several different varieties of plastics in here, and those can go right back into consumer goods. Still only a prototype, the potential of this mobile water cyclone system is clear, and its insights may well be applied to still larger challenges, like the landfills themselves. But for now, it's a reminder that in a world wrestling with the impact of oil, innovation and invention are also secrets that should not be easily forgotten. So, what did we learn from this? Number one. <laughs> Petroleum is used for many things. <laughs> Two main things. This is for energy and materials. So, uh, petroleum is running out, right? So, what's our answer to this? We have to replace gold, right? Yeah. Okay, how do we replace the energy from petroleum? Alternative okay. energy. All right. Solar, wind. Solar, wind, wind. 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 biofuel. Biofuel, nuclear. Yeah, well, that's actually sad to say, you know. <laughs> Not very. I'm not very optimistic about nuclear in the U.S. Okay? It's just uh, the people's um, Isn't it very harmful? nucleus is just too deeply entrenched. Because um, nuclear power is, is very harmful because of the side effects it has, or the, the byproduct it has. The, the nuclear waste, right? Yeah. So think of it this way, okay? You mean the U.S. is not producing any nuclear waste right now? No, well, not exactly, but right. I'm, I'm just saying that that's yeah. just, it was a huge thing back in the 70s, right. so but for... The, the new nuclear technology is much safer than the new. Okay? The design and the... Uh, much, much safer. Okay. So, you say, well, what about the waste? We have to use a lot more waste from the weapons. <laughs> <laughs> okay? Yeah, there's still nuclear weapons operating in the so it's, it's, you know, it's a trade-off, you know. A lot of people say, well, I'm not even going to think about it. Okay, 
of the faith. But it shouldn't be of the faith. Nuclear has a huge advantage as versus But, um, isn't it better to use like renewable? Because that isn't nuclear, non-renewable. But yeah, it's, it's not nuclear. But uh, okay, okay, if you have fusion reactors, it's renewable. I mean, right? So even if it's not technically renewable, the resources they so as good as renewable, right? So so there are you know these are complicated questions. You know, there are no set answers, right or wrong. But that's why you know, we have to keep an open mind because technology change. No? No. Anyway. Uh, that. So energy is to replace by renewables, right? Okay, so think wind. Okay, we have wind. But how do we capture wind? It, that's the thing that wind is inconsistent. No, no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what, what, how do, what do we do? Wind. Uh, wind. Wind. Okay. What are the turbine blades made of? Ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> You think it's made of metal? No. Which uh, uh, country right now in Europe uses a lot of wind? Where, where, where you have most wind? Okay, on land or something like that? England? Chicago. Chicago. No, they, 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 the rest of the world, I think. Okay. The biggest wind is on the ocean, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay? Countries, you know, in the northern Europe, okay? They put it very close to the ocean. There's lots of wind. Constant. In and out, in and out, okay? Because you have onshore wind, offshore wind, daily, okay? If you use metal for the blades, aha, <laughs> right? It wouldn't last, okay? Because the ocean has salt sprays, okay? Any metal will not last, okay? So it's made from plastic. Is it simply plastic? No. no. What else? Oil. Ah, <laughs> oil is made from plastic, so <laughs> <laughs> Huh? So other stuff, okay? So the blade, okay, the blade has to be sort of, you know, robust, it has to be strong, right? The wind, you know, the, to, to be worthwhile, the wind uh, span has to be long, right? Otherwise you don't gener generate much, okay? It also uses lubricants to... Yeah, that too, so you don't lose uh, friction, but in the blade, you know, the making of the blade of the wind turbine, what other things to make it strong? The plastic is not that strong. Right? Carbon? Aha! Carbon what? I don't know. <laughs> Fiber. Yes! <laughs> okay? Carbon fiber. Okay? In a plastic residue. Okay? So, to capture renewable, you still need material. Okay? Alright? You cannot get energy without material. Okay? Alright. How about solar? How do you capture solar energy? Solar panels. Okay. Okay. Cells are made of? Photovoltaic. But there are, of course, you know, the best way to get it. But the, you know, a lot of it's plastic. Right? So, just because it's a renewable doesn't mean that you don't need material. A lot of materials still come from. Yeah, so then how would you solve that problem that dilemma that well, one the, of these the, things? The thing is recycled, of course. Recycled. Alright, so the material, of course, you don't destroy it, right? The good thing, the energy you use it. So, okay. Not in the sense that it's okay. it But material, you don't destroy it, right? So if you can reuse it, then it will last you, you know, every, every, you, you, you recycle it once, uh, you may have to lose or whatever, but you know, you're not losing 100%. So if you can last you a lot. Yeah. So like, material is recycled, but, but not everything is recycled. A lot of plastic, uh, valuable plastics are uh, a coating. Okay? If it's a coating, you can never recover it because it's tinsel. Okay? It's supposed to be firmly bonded to the substrate. You're never going to be able to extract it out. So there are limitations to how much you can recycle, but you have to do the background of it. So you can extract. In some sense, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the the thinking is, you know, the, the oil, you know, uh, natural gas and oil is increasingly a much 
more precious resource, more for the material rather than the energy in the long term. Because you could have replacement for the energy, but you're not going to have replacements for the material. Okay? So in fact, for a long time, people say it's a, it's a tragedy or it's a crime to burn the uh, oil for fuel. Okay? It should be reserved as a raw material for materials. Oh, no. oh, um, if you, like, let's say you have the film on it or something, is there any way to get that with, like, burning it? Uh, you need, can they recycle? Recycle, yeah. you cannot destroy it. You know, if you destroy if you burn it, it's, it's broken down to, you know, very small units. So, so you know, it's, uh, it's not technically called recycling, you know, but it just, I mean, if you consider that recycling, you know, <laughs> Original state that is not working. It's not like it's technically impossible. So the whole thing about engineering is that we are trying to do the, the feasible. Okay, so a lot of things are possible, but it's just not feasible. Okay, so that's why we we, we are always valuable. Okay, society. Okay, we can always make things Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can I feel it? The buttons are plastic. 
Because <laughs> 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 you think it's other things. Hair is classic, that's for sure. What about this one? Yeah. Yeah. Sleeve, yes. Okay, I'll let you touch it. Oh my gosh, okay. Uh, oh my gosh, okay, so hydrocarbon or, or, or natural fiber? Uh, no, no, no. Just numbers, I can't tell. Hydrocarbon. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> More likely to be? It's carbon. This is polyester, okay? Yeah. But modern polyester are much better than old time polyester. You know, they always have a joke, right? You know, the, the, the used car salesman. In the polyester suit, right? Everybody has that picture? Oh. You know, the, 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 the plant, like, you know, the cactus. Oh. The, the, the yucky looking polyester. Right? It was all nasty and all. Nasty, yeah, <laughs> nasty and whatever. It's no longer true, okay? Modern polyester is so good that, you know, experts, only experts. I'm not clothing expert. <laughs> I'm here for environmental Definitely. <laughs> That's. Oh, that yeah, looks very thin. Oh, yes, That's um. Thin. Okay, so what is it? No, it's hydrocarbon based. It's hydrocarbon based. Hydrocarbon based? Sure? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Deal or no deal? No. <laughs> <laughs> no deal. <laughs> $10,000, yes. <laughs> 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 hmm? Yeah. 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 Cotton breeds? Polyester. Yeah, what do you get? Is it? See the symbol? Everybody recognizes it. No, I can't see. Oh, it's funny. You guys don't buy any clothes? No. Not those kind. I don't think it's a symbol. It's a trademark of pure Okay. So it's not how to go. I love $10,000 in my dorm. That's it. No deal. Oh, yes. That's great. So, I'm done with the trick question. Okay, so here. Pleather. Oh, God. Natural. Natural. Pleather and metal. Pleather. So, he's always going to be the one chair. You don't know. The inside. The lining. Okay. Just the outside. Hydrocarbon base. Hydrocarbon. Huh? Pleather. I'll tell you it's hydrocarbon base. The more you look, the more you're I'm telling you it's pleather. Huh? Yeah. Is it real one? Hydrocarbon. Well, if you ask me, is it real one? It's so real, it looks fake. It's so good that it's real. Yeah. Oh, that's a pomegranate looking thing. Yeah, no, no, I've never been to this. No, but I've never been to this. You know what it is, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's so good. Oh, it's natural? Yeah, wood. Natural. Natural. Oh, the paint is a good thing. Well, it could be real and it could be paint. Like, it could be made out of like wood and then it could be made out of plastic. It's actually not wood. It's some natural wood. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I told you it's a pomegranate. I knew it. It's a pomegranate. Oh, no, it's some, 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 no? The, the skin is very thick. Okay, it's very woody, uh, thick. Uh, then it's, 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 it's like this dry um, brown thing. Um, it's called, um, oh, I forgot what it's called. But <laughs> it's <laughs> stuff that. No, it's not about that. Yeah, these things. It's not about that. It's not about So what's the difference? No, okay. I think that's what it is. Okay. So, if you're a real musician, you want with which one? Oh, you want the one made out of real wood because it gives you a yeah. sound. Yeah. Okay. Because just like you know, nowadays you know, you can make violin out of fake wood. No, you know, I mean, the, you know, basically carbon fiber. Uh, oh yeah. Uh, Find it. Uh, resin. Okay. Instead of out of wood. Okay. But you think a uh, uh, concert violinist will not prefer to use the Stradivarius, right? 
Okay? So at certain level, natural still has some qualities that is I'm so good. undefinable. You know? And music, you know, the feel of it, you know, it's different. It's just like, you know, when, when digital recording first came out, right? It's clear. It doesn't have the of the of the, the other record. But to the real, you know, music aficionado, they rather hear the hissing, but with the warmth of the analog recording. Yeah. Okay? Because there are certain things which are just, you can't, you don't know what it is, but it, it, it's just, right? Yeah, music is one of those things. The music recorders are going to are so much better than the music. Okay. Oh, in the island. Oh, the like, recorders. you know? So,
the fact that it does give you superior performance in certain aspects. Right? If you buy shoes, right? You can buy shoes in the Netherlands. You can buy shoes made from PVC. Okay? Which is a very flexible, you know, specific thing that you can I would normally not, you know, I don't know. <laughs> And I teach, I stand all the time. So, so if, if your feet is not comfortable, it kills you. Okay? But otherwise, you know, sometimes, you know, if you're just going to wear it once and throw it away, then you can store it, right? So, um, you know, but that's of all I want to say that all of the activities, okay, that's depicted here, okay, the utilization of oil, that is to refine it, to make, uh, to produce energy, to fuel, make materials, and so on, so forth, the recycling of it, so on, so forth. Are then by what kind of engineers? And that is only a very small part of chemical engineering profession. Okay? You, you want to make drugs? You want to make diapers? Diapers? You want to make shampoo? Can you get it? Alright? So, any kind of material can you get Okay? So, we are indispensable to your comfort and daily life. Okay? So, so, we use chemistry to make life better. So, so which company? I forgot. It's either Dow Chemicals. Better living through chemistry. Have you heard that? Nope. Better living through chemistry. Okay, they're sort of a, a advertising, uh, you know, uh, tagline. Okay. Mm -hmm. Better living through chemistry. That's kind of right. Okay. Great. Right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.